La pandemia nos cambió la vida. No sabemos cuándo va a terminar ni cuáles serán sus efectos. Por lo pronto, nuestra vida cambió radicalmente y en medio de la incertidumbre necesitamos entender. Justo de eso se tratan las conversaciones IDE. De entender. En medio de la incertidumbre y desde miradas plurales. Bienvenidos a Conversaciones IDE. Esta es la segunda sesión de la serie La Pandemia y el Futuro y estaremos hablando de cómo se sostiene y legitima la desigualdad. Y tenemos el gran honor de tener al doctor Branko Milanovic, que es profesor presidencial visitante de la Graduate Center City University de Nueva York y profesor emérito en la London School of Economics. Tenemos como anfitriona a la doctora Blanca Heredia, que es profesora investigadora del CIDE, y pues yo estaré moderando, que soy exalumna del CIDE, Ariadna Martínez, para ustedes. Y pues te, te cedo la palabra, Blanca. Muchas gracias, Ariadna. Un gusto enorme y le agradezco muchísimo a Branko Milanovic que haya accedido a participar en esta segunda conversación, sí. Me gusta también uh, estar aquí y gracias por su invitación. Es la primera vez que, primera vez que lo he hecho en, uh, en español, pero solamente vamos a, a hacerlo en español al inicio. Y después vamos a cambiar en inglés. Muy bien, muchas gracias. Eh, empiezo con una pregunta. I'm going to start with a question mm -hmm. having to do with your very singular biography. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to ask you, because you were born in Yugoslavia, communist Yugoslavia, which was one of the most liberal communist countries at the time, but still communist. And it was Yugoslavia, no longer existing country. And then you moved to the United States and you've lived in the United States, I understand, ever since. Uh, and um, I'd like to ask you, to kick it off. How has your biography affected your work? It's, it's a good question. Actually, on, uh, on, on some small details, there are even slightly more, how should I say, more complicated parts because I was actually born in France, technically. Oh. I was born in Paris, actually. And, and uh, there was, uh, my Wikipedia entry has, has different uh, places of, and dates of birth, <laughs> so, you know. <laughs> I tried to correct it, but after a while I, I gave up. Uh, but of course, my parents were Yugoslav or Serbian. They were actually living then in, in France. And then I went back to and did uh, my elementary school in, um, in um, Yugoslavia, in Belgrade. And then they did my high school in Belgium. So, you know, it was uh, it's, it's a very complicated stuff. So, uh, yes, it actually did influence me a lot. I, I can see it much better now than obviously when it was, you know, taking place. Uh, because I was exposed to, you know, it's only di partly different cultures and partly different uh, political systems, you know. Uh, for example, when I mentioned the, the school, and I don't want to talk too much about that, I can go on for, for hours. Uh, like high school in Belgium, which was very, uh, two things were very interesting there. First, when I came, as a, I was young, I was then 14 when I came there it was a much more class-based society than what I've seen in, in Yugoslavia. There was no doubt about that. You know, the, the dating, like who would actually go with girls, uh, you know, out. It was very clear. If you're a, a son of a lawyer, you go with the daughter who is, whose uh, father is an engineer. It was very, very clear, much more than in the US, for example. For example. On the other hand, the school was very Marxist. Actually, it was a public school, Belgium public school. And the professors, for example, I had a very, very influential professor in French, also a professor in, in history. It was, you know, you know, historical materialism and Marx were just like, like the most normal thing. So in that sense, it was very interesting uh, that, uh, uh, Again, I think unlike the United States, where Marx was somehow, you know, an outsider and you would not touch it in Belgium and I think in France, and we are talking there about the early 70s, it was a part of the total intellectual, um, or, or actually in a sense, a, a part of the Almost studies like at, 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 a, at, a, at a very early level. 
So these are some observations, and I, maybe I'll just stop it here, but I think it was interesting to, you know, different societies obviously show different features, particularly when you're young and see them. Yes, I'm, I'm convinced in my own story and most people's story, biography is extremely important in, in one's outlook of the world and what kinds of questions one asks. Um, and I, I think, let me just say on that, uh, Blanca, I think there actually I wrote recently a piece on my blog uh, about the, the sort of uh, uh, non-exemplary lives, you know, that the, this is from Plutarch when he wrote about different people, he talked about exemplary life. Now, our lives are actually very non-exemplary in the sense they are not interesting lives. So maybe some people will, will contest that, but when I was reading, and that was actually why I write, wrote this blog, like reading about different people, what is their biography, I mean, honestly, it's totally boring because their biographies, I went to here to this and that school, then I became professor in that school, then I became a higher professor in different school, <laughs> then I went from one campus to another campus. I mean, <laughs> what kind of life is this? And so I actually understand that, of course, they, they write and they, they have all these other things, but not having a, a life, uh, because we are, of course, very comfortable, so we don't have very exciting lives, but not ha having to face issues that in the past people had to face exile, you know, a poisoning, like for example, Navalny in Russia today. It, it's a huge issue. I mean, if you get poisoned, it's going to change your life and, and if you don't die, obviously. So there were issues that actually in the past people were facing. You know, Voltaire was in England in exile. Chateaubriand was a book I have here in England in exile. People were actually Marx, obviously, in exile. So these were the issues that people, intellectuals face. Nowadays, we live in a much better society. We don't face them, but there is a loss, I think. I agree with you. How did you become interested in inequality, Banco? Well, I became interested, uh, I'm asked this question often because when I went to, to study, uh, you know, undergraduate, I was then again back to, to Yugoslavia, to Serbia in, in Belgrade. And I went to study, I always liked numbers. So I actually went to study statistics. You know, it was economics department, but there was a group that was doing statistics. So that's, that's what I actually was interested in because I liked the numbers. On the other hand, I think this sort of a Marxist upbringing that I mentioned before uh, opened me very much towards um, uh, social issues. So these are the two interests that I had. But you know, I, I didn't know what to do with them like most young people until, and I still remember that until I discovered for the first time a measurement of inequality. And I remember it was actually a newspaper article and I've never seen, for example, the Lorentz curve. That was the first time. And I said, wow, this is really something extraordinary. You know, we can actually have knowledge like how much income one group, one, you know, um, you know, some households have compared to the others. And that, uh, that was something that I simply realized, wow, this is really something that I would, I'm interested. Um, and I still, as I said, I still remember that summer when I saw the Lorentz curve and then the Gini coefficient. And those days were actually, you didn't have computers, but you had, uh, that was a big invention in those days, you had calculators. So I would then calculate, uh, you know, draw the curve, and then uh, you take the Lorentz curve, then you actually try to calculate what is the, the area so that you find the Gini coefficient. So that's how it was done because you would actually, and I remember you would do a curvilinear function, you know, y is equal to whatever, ax squared plus bx plus c, and then you would actually from that calculate the, the area. So that was um, how I became interested. But as I said, the background was interest in social issues. Well, that's fascinating and for our young audience, and I hope many of our students, our current students, let's see, they are listening to this conversation and watching it. Uh, I think what Professor Milanovic has just shared with us points to the importance of how, you know, sometimes little things like reading an article in the newspaper can make things kind of click. Like, like. in this case, an interest, uh, in mathematics and numbers and abstract, uh, this very abstract language with social issues. And then suddenly they come together. Um, let me move now to your last book, um, Capitalism Alone, fascinating in many ways. 
uh, where you essentially say, well, despite what m some people may say, really we have one single ruling economic system and that's capitalism and it comes in two varieties, right? As if we were in this ice cream shop and there's really only chocolate and strawberry, but they're both ice cream. Uh, and one, you say, you, you name liberal meritocratic and it's the, the, the most important example of that version of capitalism is the United States. And then the other one you call political capitalism and the maximum exponent, the most important example of that one is uh, China. One question I have there and which will start leading us towards them, one of the things I'd really like us to discuss some more and how is inequality maintained and sustained over time um, is why do you call it liberal meritocratic? the Western side of it, uh, as opposed to simply neoliberal. And I ask this because one wonders how meritocratic it truly is. And if it's only meritocratic or has become increasingly meritocratic only at the ideological and discursive level, because in fact, what the numbers tell you, your own numbers tell us, is that inheritance in various forms, not only wealth, but also social capital, say, um, is increasingly the product of, of being inherited rather than earned. These uh, higher level positions in society. Uh, so, um, let me, if I understood you correctly, that you would like me to basically address why I call it liberal meritocratic. Especially meritocratic. Yes. The liberal, yeah. Okay. I, uh, meritocratic, I'm not sure. It's discourse <laughs> or it's reality. Okay. No, the, the reason is actually that I wanted to use the ter terminology which uh, has a precedent and it's used elsewhere. So the both terms, liberal and meritocratic, come, as you know, from Rawls. Now, meritocratic, when Rawls talks about meritocratic equality, he does, he's not talking about merit meritocratic capitalism, but I take the term from Rawls. He says meritocratic equality is equality, simply equality of conditions, which basically means that there is no impediments to you sort of achieving any position status or position in society because of your, uh, I suppose, race, uh, caste, uh, whether you're born nobility or um, uh, commoner. So there is no legal impediment to achieving a game position. So that meritocratic in roles is really, from our third eyes perspective, is really not saying much. It's just saying that there are no legal obstacles to some people from, or to any group of people from achieving certain positions. So in that sense, meritocratic doesn't mean what we often sort of use the word today, meritocratic meaning deserving or that everybody gets according to whatever they have contributed. It simply means there are no legal impediments to achieving any position in society. Okay. Liberal equality from our, for uh, roles means that in addition to that e equality, which is really basically equality before the law, so that was really what meritocracy or meritocratic equality is, in the, uh, is uh, com um, to that equality is, there are two elements that are added in liberal. One is taxation of inheritance, and the other is public schools. And they are both important for roles because they are the two ways in which the advantages of family are being eroded. In other words, for those who are rich, the advantage of the family is being diminished compared to those who actually are born in poorer families by having, uh, by having uh, 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 open public schooling for everybody and by taxing the inheritance. So this is why I'm, I'm using that. And, and then if you look at actually the spectrum of countries, now talking about only Western, you know, capitalist economies, you do actually have some of them, like for example, the United States, and I think Mexico largely also, are countries that would be really meritocratic and slightly towards, because obviously we are a public have public education, we are slightly more towards liberal. And then social, social democratic countries would be more towards the liberal side. 
So that's why I use that. And that was also to just finalize, finally answer the question about ne neoliberal. I've been using neoliberal a lot, but I've been using it in less maybe scientific quote unquote publications because I find this a useful term. But I thought in this case, the book really has an objective to be uh, longer lasting. And that's why I really didn't want to use a term which has very many political connotations now, like neoliberal. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Milanovic, can yes. I like ask you, uh, you, you just mentioned about like, the, the two aspects that you also mentioned in the book like, that could my, my kind of le level out the, the, back, the ground for everyone to like, have a, a more equal so society. And you mentioned like the tax of inheritance, but I was like uh, listening to, uh, to this NPR podcast that is called Hidden Brain, and they interviewed this sociologist called Brooke Harrington that basically decided to become a wealth manager to understand uh, yes. the lives of the planet's wealthiest people in the world. And it really surprised me how these rich people go up, like live outside the system, you know, like they don't pay taxes, they don't, they are not required to have any passports or whatever. And how do you, and so I was wondering, how do you ensure that these richest people really be taxed by like the, 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 their wealth and their inheritance if they just don't, the, those numbers don't even appear in the governments or any other financial. Interest. True, true. I, actually, I do uh, quote actually, uh, Brooke, uh, you know, I, uh, I've listened to her and actually I've read some of the, her stuff. I have not read the, the latest book. Um, and as you said, uh, Ariadna, they're, they're actually these people, but there are not that many of them, you know, we are talking about within the world of a very, very small group of people. But they, that small group of people still has lots of wealth and money. So <clears throat> their importance, when you translate their importance in wealth is actually very significant. Uh, now they do live, and as you said uh, quite, quite well, they do live outside the system. And that's what is interesting with the globalized world. I mean, there are many aspects of the globalized world which are really new to us. Well, including this pandemic, because it would not have happened without globalization. Uh, but here too, without globalization, you would not have had people who are totally able, first, to travel all around the world, secondly, to play this, uh, the game of jurisdictions. Because the game of jurisdictions means that you can have not only several passwords, but you can have passwords for different uses. If you wa don't want to have to pay taxes, then you, your tax jurisdiction becomes, uh, you know, uh, some Caribbean island where you don't, you, you put all your company, all your assets, everything there. If you need a jurisdiction to actually do some jobs where you need to be an American citizen, then you produce the American passport. If you need something to get, uh, like, uh, you know, many professors do too, like to get uh, uh, EU funds, then you produce a EU passport. So you essentially have that group of people that are able to, to create a world or where they live. And it is a, a problem, but I think that actually it is a problem that countries can solve because the power of the state is still enormous. So if they really wanted to crack down on tax evasion of these people, I think they would be able to do that. Yes. Um, let me go back to the meritocracy, but at a broader le level of abstraction. Uh, how is inequality, how important is ideology in sustaining inequality and in allowing it to reproduce over time? And this question becomes, I think, increasingly important in the context of growing inequality, uh, which as you and several others have shown, inequality has been growing over the past 20, 30 years. Um, so, how important is ideology? And this goes back to meritocracy because in many parts of the world, meritocracy is a key part of the ideological discourse that justifies uh, the position of those at the very top and also kind of explains why those at the bottom have not been able to make it. Yeah, I think uh, ideology is very important. I, I will come to that maybe in, in a minute also, because of course it, it is uh, related also to Piketty's newest book, Ooh. where actually uh -huh. ideology obviously plays a key role. And he traces, as you know, uh, different types of ideologies that have justified, explained, sustained, extremely inegalitarian societies. 
And we are now facing also an ideology which uh, has uh, two components. And actually the book that I was just sort of using here is actually called The Meritocracy. I was using it to hold the, the, uh, <laughs> the, the screen, but it's a book that I just finished. It's called The Meritocracy Trap by Daniel Markowitz. And it is an excellent book that essentially uh, goes and ex it was based on, on his uh, commencement speech, speech at Yale that he gave, he's a professor at the Yale Law School and uh, uh, explained how meritocracy is an, an ideology that is now appropriated by people who are extreme, who are very rich, who actually invest an enormous amount of you know, income and time in their children. And then they, uh, they do actually, the children do very well and they're all very smart and all that. But they, what the, the danger there is that they are not willing to accept the fact that actually what they have done is essentially precluded or made it impossible for many others through high cost of schooling running in $50,000 per, per year and more, they have really created a monopoly power monopoly control of that resource. And then after you have gone through that school and you have become a graduate and all that, you have the feeling that everything that you have done is fully deserved and it's actually something that shows your moral worth. So that's actually the danger there is as he points it out. First, you basically use money and your power and wealth. Secondly, you succeed in what you have been doing and thirdly, you start believing not only that it actually belongs to you, but that they are actually, that you are morally superior because you have shown that. And so that's the creation of this, you know, upper class that uh, actually he uh, emphasized that uh, quite a lot, and I think rightly, that has this moral superiority. And uh, I think in that sense that the ideology that I just described is maintaining these inequalities because it seems to those people that they are just. You know that they have actually acquired that that income or that wealth in a in a just manner, and indeed they have not st stolen that wealth or whatever. But they totally disregard, or they don't want to face the importance of the earlier conditions which they had, and which of course other people did not have. Uh, however, I just will stop there. But of course, I mentioned that in the book because I'm using then John Rawls, and I'm also using John Romer on that. Uh, people have always been aware that the circumstances are very different. So that even when you have taxation of inheritance, and even if you have public schooling, this is not enough to equalize or to, to level the, the, the playing field. So, you know, it, it is in that sense, yes, it is a, an ideology that I think it, it is concerning because it implicitly disregards the the, the poor, actually believes that the poor really deserve what they have. Exactly. And what's I think most concerning to me and to I think many people is, of course, as any ideology, uh, the, the costs of, of believing this set of things is especially high for those at the bottom. When they start to blame themselves for yes. not being rich and successful, which in our world, in the neo liberal world is really the same thing. If you are not rich, you're a loser, right? Uh, but also, I think there's, there's another kind of darker side to meritocracy as an ideology, which has to do with the fact that these people at the top uh, don't feel any kind of obligation to those at the bottom. Other unequal social and cultural orders have made elites yeah have given elites some kind of responsibility over the poor and the people that uh, are at the bottom. But this one, meritocracy, is crass in its kind of just complete disregard of those that don't make it, right? Uh, well, I, I totally agree with you. It's actually a very good point, uh, particularly that lack of responsibility. Because I think the lack of responsibility comes from the belief that we have a society where there is no, what we were saying before in, in Rawls definition, there are no impediments to you achieving anything. So if you're a rich person, 
take uh, Elon Musk, for example, who is actually quite clear about that. If he uh, believes that there is really no reason why anybody had not become rich, or take Jeff Bezos and so on, then uh, they, the, the, the failure, as, as you said, is individual. And you, as a rich guy, have no responsibility towards that because you, you, can, you can even argue that it would be very paternalistic of you to start now telling or caring about those who have not made it. They have not made it because they didn't deserve to make it and that's the end of the story. And I think actually what is very dark, as, as you said, and we see that you know, in Deaton's book about the, 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 you know, the death of despair, is that people uh, who actually fail feel like losers. They feel that actually it's their own uh, uh, sort of lack of uh, dedication, work, intelligence, or whatever. And then they fall step by step, first in drugs, then you know, in drinking, and you have this really an incredible phenomenon in the richest country in the world that you have an underclass, in this case, not black underclass, but rather white underclass, which is interesting, with the, the decline in the life expectancy and with a sort of uh, pathology that I, when I worked, for example, on Eastern Europe and in Russia, I saw that pathology in the early 90s when a society in Russian society disintegrated. And then you had a decline, I think about, I, that was the largest decline in, in history ever recorded in peacetime. I think it was like four years of um, life expectancy of, of a decline. But you have something similar, not as dramatic. You have it today in the United States. Yes. Let me now move to the pandemic, the big elephant in our room. Uh, this catastrophe, this calamity that has befallen us. Um, I know we still have, it's very difficult to predict, but what do you see happening in terms of inequality domestically inside countries and among countries and as a result of the pandemic? And what are the likely effects of that social and political? You know, it's maybe easier for me to start with the second part. I really think, and I actually wrote about that uh, there was a piece in Foreign Affairs in March that I wrote. I think actually even the date is, I think, March 20, but it was written probably March 15 or so. Very early on, I thought then, and I'm, I still believe, that the pandemic is going to have really socially uh, very, um, how should I say, disturbing effects. In other words, the disturbances and riots and potential changes in government that we see now, and you can go through the list of countries from Latin America with Chile, where we had, you know, seen again, sort of demonstrations, the United States, UK, France, uh, Belarus, Serbia, Bulgaria, Lebanon, uh, India, Madagascar. We are actually seeing a, a mishandling of the pandemic by the governments or the, the use of the pandemic by the governments for different reasons, I suppose postponement of the elections, or you actually go with the lockdown and then you suddenly release the lockdown for political reasons, but then you bring it back and so on. And, and or combined with declines in income, insecurity in terms of jobs. So I think we are going to see that for the time being, not only during the, the pandemic, but even when it's over, because like what happened in the last crisis, the global financial crisis, the political effects came only two or three years after that. So I really believe that we are in for a period of long, uh, for prolonged period of instability in many countries, which would be essentially driven by the pandemic or by the effects of the pandemic. Uh, now, what will happen to inequality? It's really much more <clears throat> difficult than I really honestly don't know. Uh, what we see very anecdotally is that we see that actually the pandemic has affected much more people with lower income, lower skill, for the reasons that we all know. I don't need to repeat. They had to work. They are essential workers and so on. Uh, their incomes also have declined. Whereas people like <coughs> you take me or you or other people, uh, the salaries keep on coming. You are actually sitting at home. That's uh, annoying. But in terms of income, we don't really f face any change so far. So this is really, I think, what, what we have seen so far. 
but uh, I really it would be in, I really don't know when the first numbers from 2000 about income distribution in the US come, what we are going to see. You know, with the people at the very top who depend on capital incomes, they have not done badly. If you look at the stock market, which seems totally not disconnected from the real economy, the stock market is doing well. Their wealth has not been affected. Their actually income from that wealth has not been affected. So it's really bizarre. And in that sense, I think, of course, we will see probably an increase in inequality. But it's something which is very unusual. You know, I thought in the beginning that when the stock market went down, that of course the, the rich people would be quite affected as well. And that seemed logical to me. But now I see that I was wrong then. You know, the stock market has done extremely well. They are actually, it's a, it's a record high. So, you know, it, it is very strange. So I, the bottom line, I think it will be an increase in inequality. But I think the political consequences would be particularly uh, something to watch. Fascinating. Let me now shift gears and go back to your most recent book, Capitalism Alone, Chapter 3. You talk about communism and then about China. And you provide a very, I think, interesting and original explanation as to um, China's big success. Um, and essentially, you argue that communism, contrary to what original Marxist thinkers thought, uh, worked best for those countries that were least developed. And communism provided them the way to do away with the uh, obstacles to capitalism develop, capitalist development. Um, I wonder, in the one of one of the things that uh, that you say also about political capitalism maximum uh, exponent being China, in your view, uh, is that corruption is an intrinsic part of the operation of the system. However, every once in a while, and especially in the past few years, there's been this campaign on the part of the government uh, against corruption. Should we, can you talk a little bit more about that? If, if you're right, and you, and, and I see that, you know, you, your argument is very plausible uh, that corruption is a, an intrinsic part of the operation of political capitalism. Uh, why would this system want to kind of clean up corruption and how much of it is just demagogic? It's just not, not, not for real. Um, well, thank you. Let me start again with the last question and I would then go, I would like to say something about this uh, interpretation of global role of communism. Uh, because I think that part, which is in chapter three, as you mentioned, is very important, that first part, but uh, not too many people actually discuss it because it's, it's really slightly maybe difficult. But let me then go with Chinese discussion first. Uh, I argue that, uh, that, uh, uh, that um, uh, corruption is an integral part of the intrinsic part of the uh, political capitalism because political capitalism has to have, and in case of China or Singapore or Vietnam, they do have an, an efficient uh, administration and bureaucracy. A very system, efficient, very efficient. efficient. Very efficient, very efficient. So the system needs to rely on efficiency of bureaucracy, which is almost like the Weberian type of bureaucracy. On the other hand, the system, and that's the interesting part, that there's something that not that Weber could have expected, the system does not have rule of law. It has a rule by law, but of course not rule of law. Meaning that of course they, they are ruling certain things according to what the laws are saying, but the laws do not apply equally whether you are maybe politically acceptable or unacceptable, rich or poor and so on. In other words, the system <laughs> it's not impersonal. It is not impersonal. It is, not it is very personal. much personal. Yeah. It is very much personal. It depends on who you are. And so if you're my friend or if you're my or, or if you're a business person and you're working well with the system, perfect. But if you start becoming, you know, funding a possible potent political opposition, then you become absolutely persona non grata. Absolutely. And the, the system needs to have these two parts. The first part it needs because it needs to generate growth and it needs to have an efficient economy that provides the framework for growth. So that's the first part about the efficient bureaucracy. 
But on the other hand, in order for the system to be self-sustainable, it has to have means of punishing those who go against the system, even <coughs> if there is no legally necessarily a ground, or maybe you find legally ground to punish them because you want to punish them. So I think it needs to have these two things. And corruption is essentially found, and that's why I think it was intrinsic to the system, is between these two. In other words, you use then the corruption in order to save yourself from the application of that law, which is unfavorable to you, or to actually have the law become, if you need special favor, to, uh, to have the law become favorable to you. So it's actually in the contrast between these two things that, actually, that makes corruption um, inherent. Now think of this if you had a real uh, uh, law abiding or rule of law state, then you don't have the contradiction between a totally efficient bureaucracy that works according to the rules and the application of the rule of law. It's actually bureaucrats become like machines there. They just sort of deliver justice or whatever. But it's because they cannot be that in the system of political capitalism, or they cannot be that 100% of the time, maybe 90% of the time they are, because there are no political issues. But in 10% of the cases, they are political issues. And this is where I think the corruption creeps in. So now, if you're in those regimes, and then we have seen that actually they have, you know, good rulers, if you will, I mean, smart rulers, then you realize that you cannot let corruption and that part in between, between the rule of law and efficient application of the, of the rules, become so overwhelming that it essentially destroys the system. And that's always a danger. And even in China, there a previous administration of, of who, there was a really an increasing corruption. So every 20 years, I think, you have, if you're serious, you have to start sort of cutting down on this corruption. And of course, you're using that corruption, that cutting down sometimes to actually get rid of your political, you know, adversaries. But I think uh, if, you, if you read what Chinese have done, it has really reduced corruption I think significantly in this attempt to, you know, that President Xi has. And then I think eventually the anti-corruption campaign will come to an end and then they would actually again, it's like the river, I actually think they use that, that uh, uh, metaphor in the book, it's like when you have a river bed and then you have a flooding. So the corruption normally is always within the river bed and you want to keep it there. But at some point it starts flooding. Well, it starts flooding, then you really have to push it back. But you're never going to, I mean, to, to use the metaphor that Trump has been using, you are never going to drain the swamp, you know? Never. You, it will be always there, but you don't want the swamp to actually destroy everything. So that was the idea behind, uh, you know, the intrinsic uh, or inherent part of uh, corruption in a political capitalism. Muchas gracias. Yo creo que además esta parte se la recomendamos mucho a todos nuestros, a los que nos están viendo. Muchas gracias por estar con nosotros. El capítulo 3 del último libro del profesor Milanovic, creo que es extraordinario. Y además se la llama parte, Capitalismo Nada Más en español. Exacto. Capitalismo Nada Más. Nada más. Eh, creo que además toda la parte de corrupción, de lo que él denomina capitalismo político, es enormemente relevante para entender a México. Entonces creo que puede ser de gran interés para la, nuestro auditorio que, que puedan echarle un ojo a este libro en general, fascinante. Eh, muchas gracias. Y doctor Milanovic, eh, tengo una pregunta del público y es la siguiente. Eh, pues, ¿cuál es la, cuál es la ruta, en, y si nos puede contar la, la dirección y la secuencia de las políticas públicas que recomendaría para cerrar la desigualdad en países que tienen una dualidad económica fuerte entre la formalidad y la informalidad? O sea, entre los, los trabajadores que trabajan en el sector formal y los trabajadores que trabajan en el sector informal, que en México 60% de, de la fuerza laboral se puede clasificar como trabaja, trabajando en, la, en, la, en el sector informal. Well, it's a difficult question. So it's, uh, I, I, I have no really sort of a silver bullet solution for that. It's a question that, as you know, Ariadna is really present in practically all Latin American countries. 
you have this like breccia salarial and actually breccia and informalis informalis is, is really present everywhere you go to peru you go to argentina uh, and actually as i said there is you know it is a, a, a significant issue but what we know at least what i have read about for example take brazil with the decline of inequality under the lula and gilma uh, and even cardoso before one of the uh, sort of uh, engines of the decline of inequality was lower uh, informalization. In other words, it's really, I think, an issue of development. With the development, in principle, we would have less informal labor and that uh, breccia would become less. However, I have to say that what is actually interesting is that the countries that are less advanced somehow, sometimes, cannot exactly follow what more advanced countries do. Because let me put it like this. What I just said, I'm going now to sort of revise what I just said. Because if you think Mexico is less advanced than the US, then Mexico would just move and there would be much more people who will be in the formal sector and less informal. But ironically, what we also see in the more advanced countries, we see greater informalization of labor. So we have really now with gig economy and the fact that actually many people don't have a single job anymore, they are actually becoming a quasi informal sector. We actually have a situation where the uh, countries less sort of developed or less rich countries move towards being more developed and more formal. But on the other hand, they may be actually, if they go if, uh, further, they might uh, again have more informal labor. So I, I'm not, as I said, I'm not quite sure because it seems that to some extent informality has now become connected even to the very high level of development. Maybe that, that our technology, which is now new and which enables us, and I discussed that in my book, enables us to do different jobs in small pieces. You know, we don't need to work now eight hours a day for one company. And these jobs are becoming more valuable because there are fewer of them. But we can now break our work in like working different jobs, three jobs on the same, same day and in very small installments in time. Technologically, we can do that. And I think in that sense, it pushes informality further because with, uh, with that kind of jobs, you don't have the security and you don't have other advantages uh, that come with uh, sort of more steady jobs. You know, the most obvious example now you have seen maybe in California, there was this issue of how the, the Uber and Lyft drivers would be treated, whether they, they would be uh, contractors or they, whether they're employees. Because as you know, with contractors, there are many of the advantages of normal labor relationship that they don't have, including the minimum wage, including benefits, you know, so, there is, a, there is a rising informality even in the rich countries. I cannot hear you. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, it, it makes me think about, you know, risk and how risk is distributed across society and how there's this other dimension of inequality, which is how exposed you are to risk. Capitalist economies are, are more dynamic than other economic systems and and their very dynamism entails greater risk right and this can either make you you know become rich from one day to the other or lose everything from one day to the other and um and protection against such risks is uh has become increasingly unequal also and i'm thinking particularly the gig economy the uber the airbnb yeah. you know economy um and what in, in the last part of your book you you do talk the capitalism alone capitalismo nada mas uh you talk about these things what, mm. what what is your perspective as to how the pandemic is going to influence the evolution of capitalism uh in the next few years Yes, I, I do. I do speak of that in the in the last part of the book, and uh, I think it's an. Uh, let me just say that first. I think it is an uh, extremely important part to realize that what capitalism has succeeded, and not only the Western capitalism, but 
China and Vietnam, that you have actually extremely high risk there. You know, people lose jobs very easily, actually. I think in many ways, higher and higher policies in China are sort of very, well, totally capitalistic, as I called it, like somewhat jokingly, it's Hayekian, Hayekian, you know, communism. It's actually, it's obviously capitalism, but the party is communist, but it's totally Hayekian in the sense of the, of the freedom of the market. So it's actually uh, the, the risk element there, I think for many people in the labor force is even greater than what we see in, uh, in uh, more developed Western societies. Uh, and the, uh, the, uh, what is I think important in the, that last part of the book is that what capitalism has succeeded is to make the, uh, our system of values support the further development of capitalism. And I think it's very important because we know that from Plato, that the type of individual and the type of society that exists have to be in a mutual uh, uh, correspondence and interdependency. In other words, a, s different types of societies stimulate different type of individual. Now, and he actually sort of talks about four different societies, you know, monarch, I mean, democracy, demarchy, um, uh, uh, dictatorship, and um, oligarchy. And they uh, sort of support different types of, of individual. Same is true in this case. For capitalism to grow, to become sort of globalized, to actually create new fields of work, like expansion in Uber, expansion in our private life and all that. It has to have a value system which puts the acquisition of wealth and income at the top. And that is actually what we have absorbed and uh, sort of internalized and in our ordinary behavior. Because we, of course, as we were saying before for other people, you know, in the first part of the conversation, but we have also internalized that basically what is glorious to use, uh, you know, Deng Xiaoping's term, is to be rich. So this is what is our value system. Now, we might not say all that openly because we think it's not really very nice to say that. Although when you go to a more recently capitalist countries like China or Russia and elsewhere, they're saying that very openly because they don't care. They are just going, they want to show you that they have got like a Mercedes or a, or a Lamborghini. You know, in the US people or in Western Europe are a little bit more careful about that because they have been, you know, rich for a while and it may not be always very good to display your wealth. But in reality, this is what is the, 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 the our value system. And now that value system is really totally compatible with what I said before, the need of capitalism, as we know that from Rosa Luxemburg onwards and Marx even before her, is the expansion. So you have to expand. Now, if that expansion is driven by our permanent desire to have more and more and more, because if we started actually desiring not to have that, then there is no further expansion. You know, if you don't want to buy new technology, if you don't want to have new jeans, if you don't have to have new sneakers, there is no expansion. And I think that's what is important. And actually it has many other implications, including how we approach climate change. Because as you know, I have had disagreements there because we cannot approach a climate change unless we change that frame of mind where wealth is at the top of everything else. Because right. if it is like that, then we need more things, then there is never an end to it. And so that's why I think actually, I think sometimes I find it very naive to believe that somehow we are going to suddenly start not wanting things that we do want. You know, right. and just let me give you an example because I think it's a very nice example. I, 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 in the midst of my discussion about the climate change and how the climate change has to be dealt either by, you know, through uh, incentives, in other words, through essentially taxation and benefit policy, with some people who were actually talking about, you know, nice examples and how, you know, people should change their lifestyle, which of course is really not going to happen. I was uh, traveling quite a lot. I was then in Barcelona, traveling quite a lot in Europe. And what you see in Europe, that was obviously before the pandemic, many young people, 
the same people who actually go on demonstrations against climate change and, and in, in favor of you know, our changing behavior, the same people keep on traveling for 30 or 40 euro every weekend from you know, Barcelona to Prague, from Prague to London, from London to you know, Toulouse, contributing to you know, pollution and to CO2 emissions and all of that. Why? Because you know, they have, they can do that. For 30 euros, they can do it. So I thought it was very funny. I thought actually I see them in these long lines instead uh, standing in front of this ship, uh, air, uh, airplane companies flying and then coming back home and going on the demonstration against flying. I know. And talking about young people and demonstrations, uh, one of the, I think the most interesting phenomenon recently I, in, in my mind uh, has been kind of this political awake, awakening of youth in the United States uh, around climate change originally and very much around blacks, Black Lives Matter. And, um, and a lot of them, and some of them from you know, high income groups, white, uh, have become increasingly socialist and progressive in a kind of radical way. And they are big supporters of Bernie Sanders. Well, let me just use that as the launching pad for, for one of my last questions. Um, one of the many things I find interesting and singular about your work and your, and your biography, if I may go back to that, is that you do talk about communism. You also, and I'll go, that will be my last question, you have a very solid kind of a humanist uh, education abroad. You know, you obviously read literature, you even write about Jane Austen, and um, mm -hmm. that's not very common among economists, yeah. uh, especially the, the neoclassical kind of standard over the last 30 years economists. Um, but anyway, do you see any grounds in, in the present world and in the near future for the resurgence of some kind of communist inspired movements, political projects? Communism, I'm not seeing that because, you know, again, we have to go by definitions. And if we define communism, and I think it actually makes sense to define it, the way that it defined itself, which is um, social or state ownership of the means of production, and centralized coordination in decision making, then I don't see any sort of desire for either of these two things. But what I can see in what, as you mentioned, among the increase in interest among the young people in the United States is uh, something real. And I think it is uh, going to be accelerated by the crisis because what the crisis has really brought very clearly out are all these issues, including, of course, on the health side, which we all knew. But you know what the crisis does? It's like within families. You know, if you have some underlying tensions under families, you know, if the life goes on normally, you don't. They, these things don't reveal themselves. You know, the fissures, the 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 the, the breaches, as you say, the the dividing lines, they don't reveal themselves. When you have a crisis, it suddenly reveals itself. And in this case, it does, it did. So I think in that sense, I'm optimistic that actually many young people are now <clears throat> taking actually for obvious that the US, for example, should have you know, health insurance for everybody. Uh, it is, they are also becoming much more aware of the advantages that we were talking about before, about the education, extremely high uh, cost of education in private sector, the advantages that it gives to the rich people. Now, of course, from your individual point of view, you continue playing that game because if you don't play that game, you're going to be actually at a disadvantage. But at some point, this is like a coordination problem. You, you have to realize that that system where actually you have to pay uh, more than the average, actually twice the average salary of a person in the United States just to go for a college for one year it's really not a system that is sustainable nor it is actually generating good results. So if you have changes in the health and education, I think these are two very important elements. In, uh, and on top of that, you can put housing that would actually change the society. So in that sense, I'm very optimistic because I think that the failures in both health and education have become very clear now. And the only thing which is unfortunate 
is that, uh, that the political expression of that so far has been limited. And the fact that you have now as a presidential candidate, somebody of, with 77 years of, of age and who has been really in a different world for last 40 years is not encouraging. So that I think is, is, is sort of a inability of the American political system to translate that groundswell of support for certain types of policies into the political arena. And I think that's what we will we'll see uh, this year, unless maybe afterwards the, the left side of the Democratic Party becomes sufficiently strong to make changes, uh, durable changes. Well, thank you so much. Let me ask you a last question for our audience, for the, the younger part of our audience. If, if a young woman, say 17, 18 years old, wanted to study economics today, what would you tell her? What would, how would you would advise her? Well, I have to think about that a little bit because uh, you know, economics doesn't have a very good reputation. Uh, first, people are put off because it looks very uh, sort of technical and it is. And they're also put off because economics has gradually moved more and more toward abstract topics. You know, when economics started with political economy, and actually even Alfred Marshall divine, de defined it as a, as a science which deals with the ordinary uh, a, a part of life. It actually is a social science. It should deal with something that we all daily experience. And we experience work or lack of work, money, uh, purchases, consumption, production. These are all things that we every day experience. But unfortunately, it has really become divorced from, from that because it has become a very sort of dry, abstract uh, um, economics. So I would, okay, so what would I say? I would actually say that, that there is still hope because I think precisely for the same reason that I said before, more and more young people really want to study things that relate to economics as a social science. So that's something that relates to their lives so that they can see the usefulness of that. And I think in that sense, I think there are improvements, you know, it goes very slowly because, you know, you have uh, people who have accumulated uh, CVs and pedigrees over 30 years. They're not going to suddenly start changing what they write. And people who actually clear these papers who themselves are of course a part of the same system. But I think I would, I would be a little bit, I would be more optimistic. I think with you mentioned, just to end on that, the issues of Black Lives Matter, the issues of discrimination, issue of slavery, which has always been like an issue, like totally out of the, you know, economics. Uh, the issue of class. I recently had a paper and we had a discussion whether we should put class-based societies in the title or not. And I said, well, if you put class-based societies, nobody in economics <laughs> is going to publish the paper. Because it's actually quite extraordinary when you think that Ricardo's whole work is class-based. He's the founder of our discipline. But we now cannot use the word that the founder was using. I mean, it is like totally crazy. And so that actually, so in that sense, I do see some hope. And if she is interested in some of these issues, I think that they can be studied now much more than in the past. And she would have the data to study them. You know, even things like colonialism, which for which we didn't have the data and we didn't study. I think they have now coming back. Muchísimas gracias por su tiempo, por tu tiempo, Branco. Muchas gracias a ustedes. Gracias, Adriana. A nombre del CIDE, de la comunidad CIDE, que incluye centralmente a sus alumnos, a sus exalumnos, a sus profesores, y a toda esa comunidad grande que sirve a México a través de producir conocimiento y generar este tipo de discusiones, desde miradas plurales, no una sola mirada. Eso es el CIDE. Muchísimas gracias. Franco Milanovic, por esta extraordinaria conversación. Muchas gracias, Banca, y muchas gracias, Ariana. Muchísimas gracias. Con miradas muy, muy diferentes de una persona a otra. Es, <laughs> me parece muy importante, pero si, si tenemos una sola mirada, como en francés se dice la pensée unique, es una situación que no, 
que no va. Exactamente. Gracias. 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 Muchas palabras, muy, muchas preguntas porque su, tu investigación es fascinante, pero muchísimas gracias por todo. Muchísimas gracias, Blanca, por la oportunidad y muchísimas gracias, mil, doctor Milanovic. Un gusto. Muchas gracias. Gracias, Ariadna. Nos vemos pronto. Hasta gracias. luego. Hasta luego. Bye. Gracias por acompañarnos en Conversaciones Sí, un espacio de diálogo para entender en medio de la incertidumbre desde miradas plurales. Nos vemos el próximo lunes a las 8 de la noche.